Well, this morning, I want to start us off with a, a question to consider. And, and this is one to, to ask, ask the people sitting next to you. So what factors influence a person's political view? So just, just talk to your neighbor for just a couple seconds and ask, what, what factors influence that? All right, well, it sounds like there's a lot of them. Okay, so, <laughs> so there, there, there really probably are a lot. And we certainly hope that our faith is one of those that comes towards the forefront of that. But probably your family, your upbringing, a lot of your experiences, the, the place that you live. I mean, there's just there's quite a few different things that will influence those things in your life. And we're going to be talking about faith, of course, today and how that intersects with our politics. Uh, just so, so you can see, this was actually a recent study by a group named Barna. They, they kind of researched Christians and that kind of stuff. And they said these were kind of the, what, what Christians said were the, or probably not just Christians, people in general for this slide, um, the things that influence the most in their political beliefs. So 18% of the, of the nation says that religious, religious beliefs are the most important thing. 10% uh, says family. 8% uh, says news media. And 7%, uh, I say friends, are the most influential pieces uh, of how they, they decide their politics out there. And, and amongst Christians, here's something interesting. Reasons for supporting a particular candidate amongst evangelicals, those are conservative Christians. 26% say character, 19% say positions on moral issues, 15% say leadership ability. And when you look at th those combinations of things, it's, it's no wonder that, that, like we said last week, there's this kind of collective, oh no, you know, what is going on? What is going on with, with our country and, and that kind of stuff? But, but maybe the key point that we talked about last week was just gaining perspective and remembering where our citizenship lies. Right? That, that our real hope never is any, in anything in this world, including politics. That's never the source of a Christian's hope. We certainly pray for good leaders. We, we long for good leaders. But that is never our ultimate hope. It's in Jesus Christ. It's not who's in the Oval Office, but who's on the throne. That, and and that, that's the perspective that we keep throughout all of this. Well, today we're going to talk about some additional things related to how our faith intersects our politics. And I can pretty much guarantee you I'll probably offend everybody today. Uh, so actually, we're going, to, we're going to stick with what the Bible teaches uh, on that, on those issues. But, but we're, also, we're not going to play favorites either. Uh, and, and so there's even some examples that will kind of... Uh, kind of pick on two different candidates uh, today as, as part of as we, as we do that, talking about that today. So anyway, let's, let's, uh, let's dive into what we're going to talk about this morning. So first of all, uh, one of the things that we're called to do as Christians, and by the way, these are the sermon notes in your bulletin if you want to follow along with that, we're called to actively engage the world around us. We're called to actively engage. In fact, uh, I, I love what, what God said through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, you know, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which you're going, right, to, to, to where he's sending you. And we think about what, what God is saying uh, through Jeremiah is that, you know, you guys are all being carried off as prisoners, as slaves to Babylon. And he says, seek the, the shalom, which, which is more than just like absence of violence. It's actually seek the best that God has. Seek his ways and the blessings of following him for, for that peace of the city. And, and it's, it's important, I think, to notice that, that he doesn't say just withdraw or, or just wait it out. Wait out the 70 years and just, just you know, it just, you, you might not live through this, but maybe your children, your grandchildren will someday be free, but just, just ride it out. That's not what God says. And I think this is important for, for us because there's some things that relate to how we interact with the world around us. I, I want to I share with you two, two extremes that sometimes happen in the church. One's called quietism, the other is activism. And actually, both are considered heresies, would you believe? Uh, 
And, and quietism is, is one of those things that said, actually, what we're supposed to do is just withdraw from the world around us. That, that, that we're just going to try to, to separate ourselves uh, from society as much as possible to try to limit its evil influence on things like that. And so, um, like, Amish would be an example of that. We're just going to try to try to keep the rest of the world at bay, not really interact with people uh, because they're... They, they have more evil about them and their ways that, than we do. And so we just kind of try to stay out of the world and politics all together. And that, that's called quietism. And then there's, there's kind of the other extreme. Uh, it's called activism. And, and this is where people say, you know, um, we'll actually probably do a really good thing if we marry politics and religion together. Uh, because they make such a wonderful couple uh, when that happens. <laughs> And, and, and a lot of times people think that if we really want to change culture, what we have to do is change the laws and change the leaders uh, and things like that. But, but it, it, that, that's never been the traditional Christian stance either. In fact, if you go and look historically, you go, how, how do things actually change? How do uh, nations and stuff become more Christian? It's never because you change the laws first. It's always because you change the hearts and the laws follow. And as people become devoted followers of Jesus, it changes, it changes their entire lives, and that overflows out of them into everything. Unfortunately, the reverse is true. The fewer people who follow Jesus with everything they have, the less it will impact their laws, and it will impact their culture. And we, we are experiencing that in the world around us. We certainly see. And so where, where's the balance? Where, where do we actually meet? What does the Bible actually teach with that? And, and I think we, we see an example in what, what Jeremiah spoke about, seek the peace and the prosperity, the welfare of the city. He's talking, of course, about that city of Babylon. And, and, and this, this was a pagan nation. The, these were not followers of God. And, and yet their call as Israelites was to go there and, and to, to try to actually love people to go in there and, and even despite the fact that they had very different religious views and very different political views and, and, and these people they probably thought were, were, were not nice people at all. They were called to go there to make a life but also to seek the peace and the prosperity and the welfare of the city. And I think there's probably some things there that translate to you and I. That there's something that we're called to do. It's not to, to remain quiet. It's not to remain uninvolved. That, that's never what the Christian is called to do. But it's to be active, to be active agents of God in this city, in the world around us, to do good, to love people in the name of Jesus. That's what we're called to do. And, and the thing is, is we, we, we don't stay out of politics. In fact, one of the things that I really, really hope is that some of our people will, will go into politics, that, that, they're, that they won't be turned off by the th some of the things they see around them, but that we will actually have godly people who really do put aside special interests and, and all kinds of things, but really work for the common good. And, and there are some wonderful politicians uh, in the world today there certainly are some wonderful ones out there, and, and praise God for them, because they, they really do seek the common good. And we, it, it, it is meant to be a very noble profession that maybe doesn't look as noble on the media right now. <laughs> but, but it is meant to be one of those things. And so I hope that there will be some of our people that will go into that and, and, and actively seek the common good and the peace and the welfare of people. That's a very noble and godly thing to do. So, some things to recognize in terms of being a follower of Jesus and how we interact with the world around us, including in our politics, it, it, it starts with a couple things. First of all, recognizing that, that God chooses you to be on his team. He calls you. He says, you are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. And, and even though you, you do some things that, that I don't like, I call sin and actually break our relationship, it, it doesn't make me not want to claim you as my own. There, there, there's an unconditional love that the Father has for you, even when you sin, even when you do things he doesn't like. He calls you to repent. He calls you to turn away from those things. But he says, you're mine, and I love you. And, and one of the great things about that 
is about the, the fact that God chooses us, that he calls us to be his own, uh, is that, that he thinks that, that you're, you're someone of value, that he wants you to be on his team. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting that, that when you're part of God's family, there, there's almost like a family business that we become a part of. Now, it's not about making money or things like that, but, but it's about what God is up to in the world. That there's a God who has this overarching story in all of history about, that talks about creation, and there's the fall, and then there's, there's the redemption in Jesus Christ, and then the restoration of all things that we're all looking forward to. That, that's the part of the story that hasn't come to pass yet. And, and we find ourselves living between the cross and Jesus' second coming when he's going to restore all things. And, and, and we're invited into his story to be his representatives and to be active agents in the world around us and, and, and pursuing the, the things that he loves and doing things in the way that he calls us to do. He chooses us to be his representatives and, and his active agents in the world. And, and, and to that end, he also commissions us to act under his authority. You ever think about what that means to be commissioned or, or to do something under, under someone else's authority. It, it means it's, it's not your idea. Well, what, whatever you're going to do, you don't get to make up the rules, right? It's, it's that, that God has a, a way of doing things. He says, you're doing this in my name. Like, whenever we say we do something in the name of Jesus, we're saying we're doing it under his authority, we're doing it in, in the way that he calls us to do it. And, and it's important for us to remember because God just doesn't, not only cares about what happens, but he cares about how it happens. And, and, and there are things that in your life and in my life that if, if, we, if, we, if we say to ourselves, the end justifies the means, that is not God's ways. That's not it at all. God actually cares about how we accomplish things, that they're done in accordance with his ways and his will. And, and what an important thing it is to be commissioned by him, that, that God sees you not only as part of his family, but as someone that he says, I want you to be my agent, my representative in the world around me. I believe that you can do that. And, and one of the things that, that, that's always part of God's ways is doing things with gentleness, and respect. That, that's just part of his ways. That, that's who he is. It's who he's called us to be. And, and whether it's giving an answer for why we believe, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, or, or anything else that we do, that's just part of how he does it. That's part of how we operate. All right. You ready for me to step on some toes? So... Uh, once again, we're going to give equal opportunity here. So, uh, first of all, one of, uh, we're going to give some examples of, of how, how we do things God's ways. And one of it has to do with respect for women. This is something that, that the Bible is very clear about. And something that's been in the news a lot with one of our candidates. That, that there's been a, a significant problem in terms of this. And, and the Bible's pretty clear about this. Uh, in 1 Timothy 5, can you read this with me? Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. And this is consistent with a lot of what the Bible says about, about what it means to uh, just be a follower of Jesus and how we relate to to all people, but specifically women. We're just talking about that today, and this is more probably to men than anyone else, is that we're, we're called to, to think of them and to respect them uh, in, in ways that are in line with who God created them to be. You see, God created them to be co-heirs with us. They, they, that there, there's, there's no difference between male and female in Christ. That, that's what it says. We're, we're all joint heirs of the kingdom of God. And um, just think about how you'd maybe be upset if someone treated your daughter disrespectfully or your wife disrespectfully or your mom disrespectfully. What, how do you think God feels when people treat his daughters disrespectfully? It's, it's not who we are. 
It's, it's not who we're called to be. And so this is something that not, not just aimed at a politician. It's for all of us. It's for all of us to be aware of this. This is something we are called to do, to treat women with dignity and respect. And especially when, when some comments get sexualized and those kind of things, it, it's not appropriate for us to pass those on. It, th those aren't appropriate things for us to joke. It's just not becoming of you as a follower of Jesus. We, we're, we're held to a different standard in that. Uh, here, here's something I found. It was kind of an anonymously on the internet. It says, guys, it's simple. Treat your girl like how you want your dad to treat your mom, your future brother-in-law to treat your sister, and your future son-in-law to treat your daughter. There you go. <laughs> it's simple. It's simple. And that's something we're called to do. And, and when that doesn't happen, it's a serious character problem. It's sin. All right. So that, there's, there's one shot. Now let me, let me flip things too. We, we also respect life, all forms, uh, every aspect of human life. And it really, for, for us, the foundation for that is, it is, is the fact that human beings are, are separated from every other part of creation and the fact that they alone have the distinction of being created in the image of God. And so what, what Christianity has historically said is that human life has intrinsic value. It has intrinsic value. And, and it's not that we don't respect women's rights or, or even those kind of things, but we say there, there's more to the story than that. that, that you're, if, if that's all you're talking about, you're missing part of the facts. You're missing something because God has created life. And, and God calls it precious, whether, whether it's an unborn life, whether it's life at the end of age, or whether it's life that has some, some other challenges associated with it. All those different lives are precious to God, and they're created, they all bear His image. They do. And, and just, just so you know that the Bible actually talks about this a lot, here, this is as many as I could fit on the page and, and you know, we could all still kind of read it together. And God speaks about this, that, that, that he knows this, that there, there's been a, a destiny that he's, he's foresaw and foreknew for all people. And so, so God is definitely pro-life. And friends, just, just so we're clear, this is a moral issue well before it was ever a political issue. And, and that's why we talk about these things in church, that, that, that the Bible is not ambiguous about this. It says that God is a God of life, and he creates all life, he loves all life. It's been created in his image. All right, so now that we're done offending people, we'll go back to uh, something important too. The thing is, we're, we don't stand here to condemn people. There are people here that have made some poor choices, maybe around respecting women, maybe in terms of respecting life. And, and, and even if, uh, if that didn't, didn't pertain to you, there's a whole lot of other things that we haven't respected. We all fall so far short in this area. That, that none of us can stand and, and condemn other people. We can't do that. We're, we're all broken. It's, it's in different ways. And so our only hope is, is not to try to justify it, not to try to make ourselves feel better about it, but to go to the cross and to say, God, forgive me. It's, it's never to celebrate those things. It's simply to say, Father, I am broken. And, and maybe I got caught up in, in, in my own selfishness, and maybe I got caught up in, in what the culture around me said was okay, but it's not. And it leads to all kinds of brokenness. And Father, I want to do things your way. Forgive me, and thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, because I know that covers all kinds of sin. The stuff that we just talked about, and so much more. It's where our hope lies. So our true hope lies is in Jesus Christ and his forgiveness, his redemption, and his desire to make us whole. The great thing about being forgiven sinners is that God sends us out again into the world. 
He, he doesn't say your, your damaged goods. He doesn't say, or, or he doesn't even think of you as like second choice. Well, if this is all I got left, I guess I'm going to send you. No. <laughs> you're, you're part of the team. You're part of the family right from the beginning. And he says, I, I want to send you. I want you to be out there. I want you to be representative. And, and there's a lot of different ways the Bible talks about this, but one of the most famous ones is from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. That, that's titles that Jesus gave you. He chose you to be those kind of people and to go into things that, that are broken, to go into things that, that look kind of dark, and to be different, to reflect him and his ways. And, and, and because, because who, we, who we are it isn't, isn't so much about, uh, um, it, well, it's, it's mostly about who we, who we become through Jesus. About, it's about the transformation that God does in us. And the really cool thing about that is, is as Jesus changes us, we bring it with us. We bring his ways with us because it's who we are. It flows out of our being. It flows out of what he wants to do in you and in me. We become those kind of people of salt and light. Here's our final point for this morning. And this is, this is a distinction between Christians and, and, and much of the rest of the world. We're called to actually make choices differently than what a lot of people do. We seek what's best for people over what is best for ourselves. Think about how countercultural that is. A lot of times, I bet you got, you got friends, maybe you've thought this way in the past, that, that, that when I vote, I vote about what's best for me. But did you know that's not what the Christian is called to do? There's a different ethic behind our choices, including our politics, as a follower of Jesus. And it has to do with, with this idea of what does it mean to be a righteous person? A righteous person. Let, let, let's read this verse together. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. So there's this biblical commentator, Roos Walke. He says this. He says, the righteous are willing to disadvantage themselves to the advantage of the community. And the wicked are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. And, and, and he came to that conclusion after looking through all the examples in Proverbs and, and the Old Testament about, about who's considered righteous, who's considered wicked. And, and, and one of those key traits, it has to do with people, are gonna, are gonna say, is it me first or is it others first? And friends, this, this, this goes way beyond po politics, doesn't it? This goes into how, how do we live? And, and do we really take seriously what Jesus says to be the greatest in God's kingdom? You learn to be the what? Servant of all. You learn to be the servant of all. And, and, and there's this, this aspect of saying, you know what? I, I'd be willing to lay down my preferences I'd even be willing to lay down my rights as, as important and as nice as those things are for the sake of the gospel. That, that there's something to me that, that's more important than my preferences and more important than my rights. There were times where Paul demanded his rights for sure. And there are times where we do do that. But more often, we lay them down for the sake of others because there's something more important than that. Our relationship with Jesus and the chance to be his agents in the world around us. So let's think about something related to that first question. Just think about this question to yourself for a minute. How will your faith impact your politics this election? What's that going to look like? The most important piece of all, however that looks, 
is to remember the big picture. To remember the things that seem so important right now and seem to be all over the media and, and therefore give us the idea that that's really what's most important really probably aren't all that big in the whole scheme of God's story. Friends, we always find our own story in God's story. We never find it apart from that. And part of being part of God's story is that we, we, we do things His ways and we seek His purposes and we seek to be used by Him for your story is interweaved with His. And that's where you find your identity. My hope, my prayer for you, beloved in Christ, is that we let our true hope remain in Christ. That the true hope is never the person who's in the White House or in any other office, but that it's always in Him. But at the same time, we seek to let our faith govern every aspect of our life, including our politics and how we treat people, uh, whether it's uh, in interactions online, how we treat people of the opposite sex, even how we treat life itself and have that respect for all. And that as we, we interact with the world around us, we do it in, in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for who you are. A God who calls us, a God who loves us despite our sin. Father, there's so many ways that we fall short. Sometimes we haven't respected women. Other times we have not respected life created in your image. And Father, there's so many other ways that we've disrespected you and your ways. So Lord, forgive us. But Lord, would you go beyond that? Would you renew us? Would you give us strength to live for you to live by the values of your kingdom and what you're doing. And Father, we pray that we would be active agents in this world, a people who are righteous in the way that we really put the good of all ahead of ourselves. And Father, that we do that in a way that points to you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.